Hello, my name is Kishwani. This K E S H W A N I Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving math problems out of this book here, the GMAT Official Guide 2021. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today we'll solve some multiple choice problems that appear on page number 69. Please turn to it. Page number 69. And after having watched this video, if you found it, if you find it useful, and if you would like to work with me, if you decide that, that you would like to work with me, that you would like to hire me as a tutor to get you ready for the exam, you can reach me at keshwaniprep at icloud.com. Send me an email and we'll see what we can do. Problem number one. Problem number 47 rather on page number 69. Number 47 says that we have two equations. One is 2x plus y we are told equals 7 and then we are told that x plus 2y equals 5. And the question simply is, question simply is how much is x plus y over 3. So listen carefully, okay? One way to go about this thing is actually because we have two equations here, two independent equations, combine them together and solve for x and y individually and once we have the value of x and once we have the value of y, we can figure out what x plus y divided by 3 is equal to. That's one way of doing it, the classical way, the traditional way, the normal way, the orthodox way. But what you have to understand here, listen very carefully, what you have to understand here is that almost all the time, almost 90% of the time, when they ask a question like this, some combination of the two variables, those questions almost all the time, as I said, almost 90% of the times, this value can be found by either adding the two equations, or if that doesn't work, then subtract one equation from the other. And in most of the cases, it will get you where you want to go. So that's what we're going to try here. Let's add the two equations, see what happens. If it doesn't work, we'll try to subtract this equation from that one and see what it happens. Let's add, let's write this equation underneath it, x plus 2y equals 5. And when we add the two equations, what do we find? We find that 3x plus 3y equals 12, which means x plus y, if you take the three commons here, it becomes 12. I don't know why I'm showing the steps equals 4. And the question is how much is x plus y divided by 3? x plus y divided by 3 will simply be 4 thirds. And that's all there is. We do not have to find out the value of x and y individually. It is not necessary. It's just a waste of time to figure out what x and y individually are. Because we don't care what x is and what y is. Let's do the next one. All we were interested in is what is their sum divided by 3? Number 48. In number 48, we are told that we have three towns, population of town X, we are told, population of town X, we are told, is four times the population of town Y. Let's make this X so that we don't confuse it with the multiplication sign. Population of town X is four times the population of town Y. We are further told that population of town Y is two times the population of town Z. And the question simply is, what's the ratio of x to z? Again, as always, if you wanted to, we could do it algebraically, traditionally, in a pretty orthodox manner, very traditional manner, classical manner. And you could do that if you want to. We're not going to do that here. It'll be faster simply to plug in some numbers. So let's do that. Population of x, we are told, population of x, we are told, is 4 times y. And population of y, we are told, is 2 times z. So let's begin. Let's plug in something here. Anything that you like. Anything at all. It doesn't matter any difference at all. Just don't plug in 1 or 0. Because when you plug in 1, it doesn't actually do anything. It's just 4 times 1 is still 4. You want this to change. Also, obviously, don't plug in 0. Let's plug in 100, shall we? Why 100? Oh, why the hell not? I just feel like it. So if y is 100, x would be 400. Here we are told that population of y is 2 times population of z. Y, we already told, said, is 100. We use 100 for y, which means z must be 50. There we go, we're done. The, the ratio of x to x to z, z works out of z works out of 50 right here, and x was 400. There we go, it's 8 to 1. It is 8 to 1. 400 divided by 50. 49. 49, 
in 49 we are given some some crazy chart some graph we're not going to put the entire thing on the blackboard the way it is it's important that you have the book in front of you which is why I always tell you at the beginning of every video that if you own if you don't own this book buy one immediately buy one immediately because you're going to need it you need to have one there is no such thing as preparation for GMAT without the official guide as far as I'm concerned so here we are given this chart here as I said we're not going to put the whole thing but it looks something like this and the question is this is this is tidal wave these are these are tidal wave and these are the length here or how 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 deep it is or how high it is question is what's the difference between the highest and the lowest that's what we want different in highest and the lowest so this is the difference we're looking for highest minus the lowest highest as you can see appears right here highest appears right there and I shouldn't have written anything on it because I need to write down the number and if you if you look at the chart carefully you will see that highest appears at 2.2 feet 2.2 feet that's the highest and the lowest appears here in the negative region at negative 0.5 now what they're hoping, what they're hoping is that you will simply take 2.2 and, and subtract 0 0.5. That's not what we can do. We're looking at their difference. So it's this high and then this deep. So it's 2.2 to 0.5 is 2.7. And if you want to do the math, it's 2.2 minus the negative 0 0.5. It comes out to be 2.7 feet. The difference between the highest tidal wave and the lowest tidal wave is 2.7 feet. The next one, number 50. Number 50 requires some writing. We are given a series, series S, we are told, and it looks something like this 1 plus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 squared plus 1 over 4 squared, so on and so forth, 1 over 9 squared, and finally 1 over 10 squared. And the question is, which of the following is true? They're giving us some different values for S and our job is to ascertain which of these five applies. S is greater than 3, it says X is equal to 3, S is between 2 and 3, S is, S is greater than 3 or S is equal to 3 or S is between 2 and 3 or S is equal to 2 and S is less than 2. And I hope you are able to see right away that that equal to thing is never going to work out. It's not going to be exactly equal to something. Oh, I crossed out the wrong thing. Lost it. By looking at it, it's not going to turn out to be the exact same thing. So let's get going, shall we? So let's take, let's get going. First thing I'm going to do is, is what I'm about to do is not going to change anything. I'm going to do it in a different color. I'm just going to do it because it looks pretty. Just because we're doing math doesn't mean that the word pretty does not apply. Doesn't mean that the word elegant does not apply. It has to look elegant. It has to look pretty. So instead of writing this one, it will be, it will be, it will look pretty if it's one over one squared. So there we go. That's the series here. One over one squared, one over two squared, one over three squared, so on and so forth. And our job is to figure out the sum, shall we? Let's begin. Then. Enough of the talk. Let's begin. Well, this is very straightforward. This guy is very straightforward. This is just one. So we're going to leave it alone. And here we're going to do it in bits and pieces. So pay attention. Stay with me here. Let's do the first five. Let's do the first five. One over five squared. And stay with me the story, okay? One over one over four, one over nine, one over sixteen, and one over twenty-five is what we're looking for. One over four is very easy. That's just point two five. What about one nine? That's something you should know. You should know how much is one nine because it's helpful. One nine is re repeats itself. If you divide, if you divide uh, by nine, if you divide one by nine, you're gonna have to put a zero, and then you put a ten. Then it goes one time, it becomes one, then you put on the zero, then it becomes one, and it becomes nine. It's just point one repeating. You should know that. But that's not too much to ask. Let's do it underneath here. It's just point one repeating. That's one nine. What about one sixteen? Again, one sixteen is something. One sixteen is something. 
some some simple things in, you have to know for the exam. As I, as I always repeat myself in, in almost all the videos, you cannot expect to sit there and take an exam and expect a decent score if basic things, if you don't have them at your fingertips. 116, how much is it? I don't know. Let's find out, shall we? Let's find out. One quarter, one quarter I do know is 0.25. Are you with me? If one quarter is 0.25, then one eighth, which is half of that, must be half of 25. Half of 25 is 12 and a half. Half of 25 is 12 and a half. And 1 16th, 1 16th would have to be half of that guy. Except we're not going to waste our time trying to figure out the exact value. It's not necessary to go any, any further than that. Approximately, uh, half of this, half of 12 is 6. So it's going to be 0 0.06. That's good enough. So, that was 1 quarter right here. This is 1 ninth right here. 1 16th we just found out is approximately 0.06. I'm going to pick up speed now. One 125th is 0 .04, 0 0.04, which makes sense because 4 times 25 is 100. If you have a 125th of a dollar, if, I, if you ask me how much money I have and I tell you how I have 125th of a dollar, I'm just proudly telling you that I'm a, I'm a proud owner of a 4 shiny pennies. Let's see what happens, shall we? We're going to stop right here. Let's see what happens. And again, it doesn't have to be exact. We're just looking for approximate. So this is 0.1, this is 0.1, that's 0.2, and this is 0.25. So it's 0.45 approximately. Are you with me? Approximately 0.45. Approximately 0.45. Let's see what happens after that. Let's see what happens after that. As we go into 1 over, 1 over 6 squared, 1 over 7 squared, 1 over 8 squared, 1 over 9 squared, 1 over 10 squared, even though 1 over 10 squared is very easy to figure out, that's just 1 over 100 is 0 0.01. But we're not going to make fuss about it, we're looking for approximately. We just established that uh, that 1 over 1 over 1 over this thing is 0 0.05, 1 fifth is 0 0.05. Are you with me? Which means 1 over 6 squared. If 1 over 5 squared is 0 0.05, then 1 over 6 squared has got to be less than 0 0.05. Has got to be less than that. And this is how we write it. We write down the quantity and put a little minus sign on top of it to remind ourselves that this quantity is less than that. How much less than that we do not care. And we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So all of these would be 5 times as amount and 4 times 5 is 0.2. So all of this is going to be less than 0.2. All of this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, less than 0.2. As you can see, as you can see, Starting from here, all the way to the one tenth, it's point one six five. All of this, it adds up to less than point point six five, and we have one in the beginning. So S is approximately, approximately one and two third. Point six five, point six six, somewhere there. Approximately one and two third. It is definitely less than two. S, the sum of the series is definitely less than two. I raised the answer. We had it a little while ago. The answer is S is less than. Let's put, let's put it somewhere here. The answer is S is less than 2 and that was answer choice E. The last answer that in the very beginning I inadvertently crossed out because I was trying to cross out equal to but I made a mistake. Number 51. The penultimate problem on the, on, on the page. Number 51. The penultimate problem on the page, the second to the last problem on the page. Penultimate is the word that we learn in our vocabulary videos. If you have not watched the vocabulary videos and if you are interested in improving your vocabulary, you can watch uh, on my channel, you will find some vocabulary videos, 100 of them. Learn those words. It doesn't hurt to have uh, some decent vocabulary if you're going to sit for GMAT or GRE. Penultimate is something that we learn on day number 11. Vocabulary, day 11. Just type in, just type in GMAT, just search for GMAT vocabulary words, GMAT vocabulary words, day 11, and put my name next to it, it will pop right up. The penultimate problem, second to the last problem, number 51, it says that we are manufacturing some things, some, some, a manufacturer is manufacturing certain product, and we are told that between between 0.3 and 0.5 percent 
between 0.3 and 0.5 percent of the parts that he manufactures are defective. Not 3 out of 100, it's not 3 percent, it's 0.3 percent, which means between, don't get confused there, 3 3 percent would have been, if we said 3 percent, 3 percent would be 3 out of every 100, it's 0.3. So it's between 3 out of every 1000 to 5 out of every 1000 parts. For every 1000 parts that they make, either three or four or five parts, they, 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 their experience, their past experience shows that, that about three or four or five parts out of a thousand are going to be defective. And their policy is that if a customer tells them that this part is defective, their policy is to give them full refunds. No, 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 no if, no buts, no nothing, no argument. If, if the customer says it's defective, you get a full refund. The question is, how much am I going to spend in refund? How much is going to be a refund amount? How much is the refund amount if we sell 20,000 units? 20,000 units were sold and the price was $2,500 each. Let's find out, shall we? I shouldn't have written all of this thing here. Let's raise this thing. We, we, we sold 20,000 uh, units and $2,500 per unit. So let's just remember it. So we're looking for the amount of refund, and this is this is the range of defective three out of three out of one thousand to five out of one thousand, and we're selling twenty thousand of them. We are selling twenty thousand of them. Let's just put down twenty because this is already out of a thousand. You see, twenty thousand. This out of, this amount is five out of a thousand. So three out of three times th th three times twenty is. 60 units are going to be defective, 60 to 5, or 5 times 26. So if you sell, if you sell 20,000 units, you should expect to, re, to issue a refund between, you should expect to issue a refund for between 60 and 100 units. And each unit is sold for $2,500. And that's all there is. That's all there is. We have three zeros here, 25 times 6. 25 times 4, I know is 100. Do you agree? 25 times 4, 4 25 is 100, and therefore 625 is going to be 150. Of course it's 150. If you have 6 quarters, that's $1.50. So it's $150,000 to 2, and this is here very simple. You have 4 zeros, 1, 2, 3, 4 zeros, and 1 times 25 is just 25. So, it's, so the answer is, you should expect to issue a refund of somewhere between 150000 to quarter million, to quarter million. Number 52, number 52. Number 52, we are given a bl little blueprint of a house and it's important that I produce the same thing exactly the way it appears in the book, otherwise it will not work. So it looks, looks something like this. This is the house, and here we have a patio. Patio looks something like this, and I'm going to put down the dimensions just like the just like they appear in the book. Obviously, this is your house, and this is your patio. And 15, 20, 35, and 40. 15, 25, 35, and 40. Did I leave out anything? That's about it. The question is, what's the area of the patio? Area of the patio. Now, you could go about in a, you could go go at it in a very roundabout way, or we can make it simpler. So we can make it simpler. Here we go. Extend this out a little bit, and just stay with me in the story. Okay, it's not drawn to scale, so don't worry about it. Just, just listen to me and stay with me in this story. From here to here, we are told it is 20. From here to here, we are told it's 40 because it's perfect square. Well, I don't mean perfect square, I mean the, is, the lines are straight uh, at 90 degree angle, obviously. So if this is 20 and this is 40 from here to here, and from here to here is 20, then from, from, from here to here, it must be 20. Are you with me? The same logic is going to apply here. From here to here is 15, and the whole thing is 35. 
which means this distance from here to here must be 20. So if we can subtract this part, if we can subtract from this part from 40 times 35, we'll have the area of the patio. That's all. Area of the patio must be area of the patio must be 40 times 35. 40 times 35. And how much is 40 times 35? Well, how the hell do I know? I know 2 times 35 is 70. 2 times 35 is 70. That I do know. If 2 times 35 is 70, then 4 times 35 must be 140. 140 and then another 0. 1400 square feet. And then subtract 20 by 20. That's it. This is 20 by 20. 20 by 20 is 400. There we go. Turns out that the patio is exactly 1000 square feet. Patio is exactly 1000 square feet. Isn't that nice? That is, that is C. Let's go on then. The very last problem on that page, number 53. Number 53 is simply asking us to approximate something. Something very simple. Something very simple. It says approximate, given approximate value, not the exact value, approximate value of the square root of 4.2 times 1590 divided by 15.7. Since they're asking for approximation, that is exactly what we're going to do. So obviously, it will take forever to try to figure out this precise value. Nobody cares. So let's approximate here. So this quantity is approximately equal to, would you agree that 4.2 is approximately 4? 4? 4.2 is approximately 4. 1590 is approximately 1600. It's approximately 1600. Are you with me? And the bottom 15.7 is approximately 16. Are you with me? Very good. Let's write our 1600. Let's write our 1600 as 1600. 16 times 100. 16 and 16 are going to cancel out. The square root of, the square root of 4 is 2 and the square root of 100 is 10. There you go. This quantity is approximately 20. This quantity is approximately 20. That was the end of the page. That's the end of the page. It seems like a logical place to stop. We're going to stop right here. Tomorrow we'll come back and we'll pick up the data sufficiency problems that we left yesterday. Wherever we left there yesterday, data sufficiency, we're going to pick up those data, suffic data suff sufficiency problems tomorrow. And day after tomorrow, we're back to multiple choice problems. If you found this helpful, as I told you in the beginning, and if you wish to get hold of me, send me an email, kashwaniprep at icloud.com, and I'll be happy to do whatever it is within my powers to do. Alright?